Sarah Hi, Sarah. Again, you know? Sarah. We now have a good Sarah. forum. Um, Mr. Della Piscoldi can't be with us tonight. He has back problems. I told him I used to think that was fake until I slipped a disc myself. <laughs> that was painful. Uh, okay. Now, would you like to join me in saluting the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, I, I uh, trust that you've all got the minutes, um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to peruse them or study them. Um, anybody want to make a motion, or would you like to? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of April 6th for uh, discussion. Second. 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 Scott, second. Give you second next one, Dave. All right. Uh, any uh, additions or omissions to the minutes? I have one minor change to add Diana Jaffrey to the HMFH present line there. Okay. Well, anything else? All right, uh, we're going to vote on the minutes as amended. All those in favor of accepting those minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous, Kelly. Accept the minutes. All right, uh, overview of the agenda. Um, section 4, project updates. The MSBA is construction documents update review. And then B is the design presentation by HMFH and the landscape architects is Halverson Design Partnership folks. And next we'll go, we'll jump to three primary site logistics and phasing plan discussion and then finish <coughs> off with the interior guardrail review. Then we'll go section five. <laughs> the next steps in the schedule, and then we'll have public comments, and then any new business, and then we will decide a meeting, next meeting, okay? Any, anybody have any complaints about the agenda? <laughs> All right, onward and upward. Matthew, would you like to take over? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so the item uh, for the MSBA DD review, uh, just to report that we, we last time we had met, we had re just received the comments back from the MSBA, their review of the design development documents. And uh, we had three weeks to uh, re make our responses to those and submit them. And we submitted them yesterday, I believe. Yes. Correct. So that was within the three week window, so that's out, and they'll review them. If they have any uh, further questions, they'll come back to us with, with those. If not, then it's, uh, we're just moving on into the next phase. So if they don't come back, that final, is that 50% uh, completed at that point? Um, yeah, or more? Yeah, it's, it's roughly 50% of the design phase, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But okay. we're actually, at this point, we're much further uh, ahead than that because those comments were reflective of the submission work. that yep. was quite a while ago at this point. Okay. Good. Very good. Okay. Mm. So uh, <clears throat> for the next part, we're going to just give you a design update on the three items that are listed there. And we're going to uh, start out by uh, looking closely at the proposed design for the playground areas. And um, that's primarily uh, done by our consultant, Halverson Landscape Architects, Har Halverson Design Partnership, is their, their name. Uh, this comes after having met with uh, Ruby, Scott, and others from the school department uh, to have a first 
uh, round of feedback on the playground design, and so we've done that. Uh, we've incorporated some of their uh, uh, requests and concerns, uh, but it's probably going to be somewhat ongoing uh, from here, but we'd like to, uh, at this stage, show you where we are and get any input that you would have on that. So I'm going to turn it over to Chuck to jump into playground and site design. Can I ask a question? When you went to, did you, did you have an opportunity to have a basic view of what the architects and the landscape architects had laid out so you could make your recommendations, or was it right from I, scratch? They came to us with a proposal, uh, but it was, it was more than a basic view. It was a very detailed view. And we went over specific apparatuses very specifically. And we made some recommendations of we thought that might be a great match. We thought like we had a little concern about this piece of equipment, or we had a little concern about that piece of equipment. Uh, we gave all that feedback, and then based on that feedback, they developed the design presentation for this evening. So I, w I would say it was beyond basic. I thought it was a pretty a fairly thorough discussion uh, with recommendations for both play areas. Ruby, I don't know if you want to add on to that. I'll just add there were there were some very specific structures that we were able to look at and talk about, and actually spend some time. Um, gathering more information about some of those structures, looking at you know sizes, dimensions, how many students each of those structures would be able to be on at once, and different developmental levels. So we looked at the preschool um, design, the kindergarten design, as well as the grade one through five. Okay, good. I just wondered how much input they had right on the get go, but yep. good. Excellent. Cool. <laughs> All right, my name is Chuck Kozlowski. I'm with Novice and Design Partnership. I've been here a couple of times, and I want to just give you a, just a real quick, um, just a point about a couple of things on the site, but I'm sure everybody already knows that. But just to let everybody know. Um, we do get a mic from Yeah, we get it. Chuck, we got to get you a microphone. Yeah. Go to the manual one. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I had to borrow your gown. So I think I got to come up with something nice or something. Okay. Um, so let you know that, just to remind you that the uh, circulation for coming into the school is you enter this way. And parent drop off is here. Parent exit is here. For buses coming in, buses come in the same route, and then come this way, and the drop off, and they leave. When buses are done for the day, uh, dropping off these gates, and this gate here will be closed, and this rear area then becomes the entire play area for, for the school. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, we have soccer fields here, softball here, the basketball court, and we have um, the main entrance to the school with a uh, with a uh, with parent drop off. And we can talk. We'll talk a little bit about that. I know that most of the talk is going to be focused on here, but we thought we'd just show the where the entrance is has that's come along also. Okay. So the entrance to the school. This. This, um, this line that you see here is the canopy um, that HNFH has, um, has designed. And uh, <coughs> so here, here, and there. What we're showing here is um, concrete. It's a colored concrete. The pattern is, is, um, is accomplished by sandblasting um, the concrete. It's, that's the scored pattern of the concrete. And this is these little these circles, these very size circles, are sandblasted in to give a to give a different type of finish. So, in this image of similar work, in here, both of these, this is the same concrete across here. This is the same concrete across here. But the sandblasting gives it a different look. So you're able to create these different patterns on the um, on the concrete. One time we had we had been showing uh, precast pavers here, but we we you know, we've taken that back and it's now um, a colored concrete. Over here we have bike racks. 
looking at something like this. And bollards, so this is stainless steel. They're located here. And we have bollards that are located here along the drop, along the parent drop-off area. So when students, um, the, the parents will be coming this way, driving along this way. Students will get out and they can run either into the building, they can hang out along these um, benches. There will also be round benches, circular benches, <coughs> at the um, multi-post columns um, along the um, canopy. And uh, just to want to remind you, I think we've mentioned it before, that the bollards that are in front, the reason that we have those, uh, as opposed to having a curb uh, to separate the sidewalk from the roadway is because we need um, a flush uh, condition for handicap drop-off, and it's easiest to do that to raise the level of the road in that location. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also helps signify to the drivers that you're in a, a, a zone that is primarily for pedestrians, and so there's additional you know, level of caution <coughs> that goes along with that. So the bollards are help, helping to separate the traffic from the pedestrian area. Would you say those are stainless steel? No, oh, they are too. Okay. That's yeah. what presently they are. We're, we're still yeah. working with uh, Matt and Devin to, to see if, if, how close we want to match the material that's going to be on the canopy. So we're working with them still on that. There'll be a material, something like that, and that um, it won't be painted. And uh, just to say that uh, these will be lawn areas here. Uh, these areas here will be planted. The front area will be a lower planting. And the rear, rear area here will be a, a slightly taller planting. Nothing, nothing very tall, just enough to be able to provide some, some difference in height. That's that for <laughs> okay, here's an overall view of the play areas. The circle defines the um, pre-K. It's the only one of the uh, playgrounds that actually has a fence around it because it's for the pre-K students. There, are, there is fencing along the uh, property line here and it's existing fencing in here, but um, the only fencing around the specific playground is at the pre-K. So here's the pre-K play, play area here. This is kindergarten. Um, this is one through five here. And this is a free play area here. And, and, and all these areas, we're gonna show you some specifics about what that equipment is and what it looks like in a perspective view so that you can sort of get a better idea because I know plan is difficult to quite understand. This is the asphalt road coming in and we're going to be continuing that asphalt across here and out. And then in the areas around the playgrounds here, this will be painted asphalt to, to um, pick up on the idea that these areas are going to have a resilient paving with some colors in it. The idea is to bring those colors across the paving and to, uh, so that when this playground is, um, <coughs> when the road is closed off, the playground becomes much bigger. We're also showing a basketball group here. Um, at the request of um, um, Ruby and the other teachers, they thought that, that kids are really going to be wanting to play some basketball. So we were able to fit that into this location over here. Chuck, quick question. Uh, how long will the painted asphalt actually last? Um, well, it's going to have to be painted again. Um, the basketball court itself is a painted surface also. Okay. So it, it's those two things will require some maintenance at some time. So how much maintenance? I'm, I'm, I'm going to just to get repainted. And I don't know if it's, if it's five years, I don't know if it's 10 years, I'm not exactly sure. Um, it should last 10 years, but it just it, it depends. You know, this surface here will be driven on by buses. Right, I was thinking with weather and quicker. We had plowing, shown plowing yeah. and <coughs> treatment. Concrete there, right. But there was some concern that concrete was going to be uh, colored concrete like it is going to be in the front. But there was some concern that we probably wanted to save money there and use asphalt. But we originally had shown colored concrete there. I think there's also a concern of the effects of um, salting the roadway on the concrete. So mm -hmm. 
the asphalt would have more longevity. On the flip side, you'd have to uh, paint it more often. On uh, longevity with the paint, um, we actually pulled some bidders and I just drove by the other day over in Rochester School, we wrapped up five years ago, uh, had something very similar. And it's, it's held up very, very well over five years. The initial cost to paint an area that was probably a little larger than what we're showing up there was only two or three thousand dollars, if I recall. So it's relatively short change um, for something that lasts five, ten plus years. Okay. Sarah. Um, so looking at the sizes and the way the playgrounds are broken down, um, can we just talk a little bit about that? I think that, Ruby, correct me if I'm wrong, the way it's broken out now, not that we want to replicate what we have now, but uh, just uh, grades one through three are in one area and the fourth and fifth graders are in another area. K through two. K, K through, through two. two. In the back. Okay. It just seems like now we have all one through five age groups together in a relatively small space or space that looks relatively similar to the area segregated for kindergarten and pre-k i'm just wondering if the space allocation has been well, we, thoroughly discussed and how you came to what we have now well the, the areas are certainly more than ample to handle the, the, the amount of students that we've been asked to program for um, we had we had at one point had one and two on one side and three through five on the other the thing about the equipment on both those is that it's pretty much going to be the same equipment that this, the kids of that age group are going to want to use it's kind of hard to, to confine the um, first and second graders and not have them use things that a third grader is using across the way when, when they haven't had a chance to use it so it's really hard to keep them away from it I don't know if you can give us a sense on on exact dimensions. Uh, from my understanding and memory from the meeting, was these are these are large spaces, and maybe they're just not represented well within the drawing. So as you go through each one, if you could just talk about the actual dimensions of each, because I think that Sarah, that was one of your concerns, yeah, was what sure how big are these spaces? Some calculation that goes into it, and I'm sure it's all we'll, thoroughly investigated. Yeah. But I'm just curious. Ruby, will all the kids one through five be scheduled? For recess at the same time? No, no. Oh, it'll be one no, grade, no. one grade at a time, except okay. for the kindergarten area. So yeah. we could we could have kindergarten so, in their playground area while first grade is in another area. So, so first and fifth grade aren't going to be having recess at the same time anyway. Right, right. and so uh, those are all really good <clears throat> questions, Sarah, that we ourselves had. But I think if you um, we give him an opportunity to go over that a little bit more and spend some time talking about the actual size and looking at the other play spaces that are more natural and embedded into sort of that, that back area, it, you'll get more of an idea of how big it actually is. Great, thank you. Okay. So, and, and question. Sorry, one, one last question on um, uh, bike racks. How many bike racks do you have set up in this school? Um, I see like one, two, about six or seven here. Um, is, that, is that enough? I mean, how many kids ride their bikes to school now? Uh, we, we don't have any children riding bikes to school. And um, right now, all of our children are bused or dropped off. We do have staff that ride bicycles to school. So that's more for staff? And after hours, too. Yeah, after hours, that's hours, what I was going to say. It's after hours. I think you'll see yeah. kids bike there. and. Will they look to lock their bikes up? We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Might be useful to have some bike racks over by the basketball and, mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, as baseball well. fields as well. Maybe. And I, I don't anticipate that we'll have children riding bicycles to school. That's kind of young for kids just to go off riding a bike to school. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe with the new sidewalks, maybe we don't Um, okay, so <laughs> just, to, just to say that this is kindergarten, excuse me, pre K kindergarten, uh, one through five, and this is the pre K area. So if we go to the next slide, we start to get into some of these areas. This is the free play area that I just pointed out. Um, there's, some, there's some earthworms that we're using to we'll do a couple of things. One is, is to provide 
an area on the other side for um, water collection in those times when um, there's a storm and it has to get um, collected on this side here. There really won't be water standing in there for much longer than an hour if there is. It's, it's intended to, to drain out fairly quickly, but it's also intended to, to catch water during those storms. Um, we're looking at, we had originally thought about this as being a sand area, but the teachers felt that um, it was going to attract a lot of um, animals that were probably going to end up using it as their uh, private litter box. So we're looking at that the more of a, of a lawn area. <coughs> um, we're, we're showing some logs here for an outdoor classroom, some boulders for sitting, some logs here for um, running around on. We have a slide built into the hillside with some um, log steps here. And we have a, um, a log structure here for um, um, sort of like balance beams, but they're up built up on the hillside. And the intent is that um, uh, you know, a wheelchair can actually get onto here also. It can also come along here on this um, um, on the wood mulch there that's intended to be a, um, uh, an engineered wood mulch for, uh, that wheelchairs can use. And so the whole thing is an accessible area as part of this free play. And we're hoping that um, the kids can spill out from the other playgrounds onto here, or that this could be used as um, a place to, to bring kids out during spring or fall, and um, an outdoor, outdoor area for, for the teachers. I have a question. Ruby, this is kind of to you, I guess. I don't know your playground rules, but I do know kids love playing soccer and football and, and a lot of games. I'm not sure what they're allowed or not allowed to do. Is that open space available for those kind of games out here for them to do that? Um, it's I think it's probably not higher. here. Yeah, we won't have that space in the back of the uh, elementary I mean, school, they, I but mean, on the right side. But that's not the playground area, right? That's off away from the playground area. So is this eliminating, like, do they play, so are they allowed to play football? Do they play they, soccer? They or are they? allowed to play football and soccer. What we will have to do is schedule that differently just because of staffing. So I couldn't necessarily have, um, right now, the way we have it, we would have um, to designate staff to be in one area and other staff in another area. If we were to, to you know, just in terms of the rules, they'll just need to be adjusted because I don't see any reason not to have the children play soccer or, you know. Well, I guess that's my point. I mean, it's a pretty common thing to do at recess. So if we're not giving them an area to do that, I think it's great all the areas we're building, but that's not what they want to do. They want to play tag and play soccer and play football. We're not going to give them the space to be able to do that. How far is the the playground from the from the neck from the field? Okay, that's a better view. In terms of a distance. Um, See, that's going to be about, it's about 600 feet to there. From, can you be specific from where to where? This, that's, that's 300 feet right here, from this end to this end. Mm -hmm. So, from here, that's 300, that's another 600 or so. Something close to that. My response to that, James, would be it, it's really a staffing issue in terms of allowing the children to have access to whether it's the soccer field or the or the or the playground okay. the we wanted to add a really basketball hoop it. back there as well uh, just we because children we'll enjoy doing better. that and they spend a lot of time we'll on that now here. right no. and, and we're putting up one hoop from yeah. I get I, I guess I'm just getting to the point that we're designing this for kids yeah right and and if this is what they well, like not, to do we're we not giving them enough space, room to make another an opportunity field, to do it no, we're putting up nice okay. things that look great and are aesthetic for what we think would be great for them to do but they're that's not what they want to do you know what I'm saying well right now the k1 to even third graders do spend a lot of time on the equipment yeah. itself um, but based on what we have, they wrote fourth and fifth graders don't really have, they don't have a lot of options. Right. So um, I see that with the equipment that is proposed here, that students will want to spend. There's some n structures that are <coughs> challenging. Um, they, they offer a lot of 
versatility for students to spend time on, as we'll see in a few minutes. But I also understand that that could wear off in terms of sort of its, it's a novelty. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I guess my point is, and I, I won't, not trying to start an argument, but we live in a very sports oriented society, and that's what the kids <coughs> love to do. And that's what they want to do. And, and I think we're kind of removing them the opportunity to be able to do some of that with the space and that we're doing that. So just my perspective on Well, it's it's a little bit of a complicated issue in terms of when you really look when you look at the site design, you know, you have you have a lot of soccer fields. There's a big field area there. There's plenty of space. But typically though you're splitting up a recess, like, that makes it kind of difficult. Right, but you wouldn't you wouldn't put your playgrounds in the middle of those fields. Because the fields are going to be used for games on weekends well, and nights and you need a legitimate soccer field or a legitimate football field you just need a big enough open space for kids to run around right and that that's why i'm saying it becomes a site issue in some ways because looking where the building's placed naturally there's not there's not a good place and unless, unless there was a flop unless you flop the kindergarten and first grade recess area with the one with one five you know so if pre if if preschool and kindergarten go to the other side yeah. And one five go to that side. I mean, I don't know if that's a possibility. Oh, that seems complicated. Isn't that right outside the fair window? We Maybe. don't right because then you get into those things. Yeah. That's it? right. I think the point is we, in the back of the school where where we want them to play during recess. We don't have a lot of room, and right, we do want some play equipment to have both enough room for a field, uh, for soccer, let's say, and the play equipment. We wouldn't be able to fit it. And actually, uh, I haven't done a school yet where there's a field uh, is part of the recess area. Often, it's it's like this. It's in a slightly separate area. The gym teachers will use it more than it's intended for recess. And I also don't think I don't think Ruby was precluding that students could go to the field. One no, right. I think she's saying that it just becomes more of a staff issue of divide up the staff of a couple of people have to go over here and then the kids may have to make a little bit of a choice instead of flopping back and forth. Chuck, uh, where would the gate be on the bus road in? There's one gate here. Right there. So that that kind of blocks out all the traffic that might be. There won't be any traffic in that whole back area during the day. So there is some flexibility on moving kids there without having to worry about traffic. Traffic. Uh, Mike, it looks like Mike has a suggestion. Could I ask the um, architects to look at where you have, and I'm trying to create a dual use area, trying to satisfy what I think you're, you're saying here, without creating a new soccer field, because you're not talking about a new soccer field. No you're just looking for like space. three or four or five kids kick a soccer ball around. So where you have that detention area in the light green in the, in the bottom left, that looks to be about 75 feet, 50 feet wide by another 100 feet long. Um, since we have sandy soils, we could probably design that so it it's, has a solid enough turf for if kids want to throw a frisbee around, kick a soccer ball, that that's a big enough area to do that without having a full field. Because again, you're just talking about a couple kids, right. not a full practice, right. so to speak. So that may be able to solve both purposes. Because it's, if that's just going to be a surface detention as a holding area in Carver Sand, that's going to drain pretty quick. And we would just have to make the soil suitable to, to accommodate something when it's not wet. Mm -hmm. That's actually where I was going to go with that. Mike, which area are you pointing out? Oh, in the back, back there. In the back <laughs> one, yeah. Right there. See that area? Yeah. Right, which is right next to the playground. So now you've got the same staffing still looking at the area. Right. And I guess I stole the thunder from Jim. Sorry, That's Jim. All right, man. No, <laughs> um, Chuck, maybe you, uh, some of this is the uh, the area of concern of our civil engineer who does drainage and things like that. But I wonder if Chuck, if you had a sense, would playing on a surface like that uh, no, reduce its I permeability? I think it's the same kind of um, lawn mix as everywhere else. So I don't think there's a difference in it being a, a lawn or a we do have we do have some berming here, which is going to prevent somebody from standing here and observing what's going on. Yeah, the, the, that's the thing I was going to ask is how down. Because the kids are little, so it's how far down is it? So I'm not sure how we see it. I mean, somebody has to stand up here to be able to see down. Green lines around it, but 
But that would be doable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, kids may want to go back there anyway, no matter what you do. They will well, be back there. I mean, that, that recess monitor on the top of On the, the hill is fine. Yeah. 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 That's a, and that's going to be a lot better than splitting people exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah. So what size is that about? <clears throat> it's like around 75 by 100. It's a good size area. It's plenty. Oh, that's no, it's plenty. It's plenty area. For that age group, right. perfect. I think that's a good option. Yeah, I think right. this play it's area. Rains. Be muddy. In addition to what we we're just talking about, the play areas, this design is really going to offer a lot of options to the children. You know, they can play on the structures. There's hard top surfaces for games to happen. There's the basketball hoop that we added. There's the free play area, and then the lawn area on the other side of the berm. So I think it's a lot to, to choose from. I can tell you one thing, because I started teaching there a thousand years ago, and I never ever remember, I taught phys ed out on that whole field area, I never ever remember water standing on that field. Yeah. You don't <coughs> have that problem in Carver. Mm. So we're going to start with um, pre-K and kindergarten. Pre-K and kindergarten here. These are the Im Im images of some of the equipment, or all of the equipment that we're that we're looking to include here. And um, what we've tried to do is to, well, you know, the pre-K is the one that has the Um, Pre-K is, is somewhat limited in the amount or the, um, the height of, of the equipment that you're able to use. And so we've done what we could to be able to get enough height in there, provide some excitement, at the same time uh, realizing that we're talking about um, four and five-year-olds. Four-year-olds too, right? Yeah, and in some cases, three. three. Oh, three years old. Then. Okay, great. That's what we have. Um, <laughs> so we have swings, which are here, and this great thing here, which is sort of like a three-person kind of teeter-totter thing. Um, all of these are designed um, so that um, kids aren't going to get their, their legs or their, or their fingers squashed in the equipment, uh, like the old days when you had um, a, a seesaw or a teeter totter, and everybody ended up getting their, their knees buckled. Um, we have this structure here because kids love to be able to do some um, role play and some creating, uh, you know, house and feeling like that they're that they're part of it, and that's located here. And these little guys here are located right there. And all the equipment is located so that it, it's, they're not infringing on each of the other pieces of equipment. They all have specific fall zones that we have to work with. Um, we've also had a um, construction budget for the equipment that we've had to work with. Um, just to let you know that that construction budget is installed budget is $300,000, not including the paving services. And that's what this comes in at. So, um, Picking and fitting pieces of in here is relatively, um, was, was, um, was a lot of fun. And we can still take pieces out and insert, but we have to make sure that whatever we put in is in that same range that, we, that we're, we're deleting. But what you see here is what, when we met with, um, uh, with Ruby and the rest of the, uh, the head, te head teacher, right, was there? Uh, other administrators. Okay. Yeah. They That's were there, fine. and there were some things that they thought were a little too, uh, a little too fast, a little too dangerous. Those have been deleted, and, um, or some things that may not have been interesting enough, and we've inserted some other things in instead. These guys here spin. They're located um, right here. So you see someone gets in, they can spin themselves or they can get spun. Same thing here. This can collect three or four kids at one time. These, I think, are going to be the thing that everybody is going to want to be on on these type of structures. And we have more of those in the, in the older areas also. Um, more climbing structure here. These are a great 
uh, swing in that. It's like sort of reminiscent of the old tire swing, but they, they lay sideways like this, and they can collect five or six kids at one time also. Um, a lot of this equipment has, um, it's an older equipment. Well, you can see here, it starts to get into the idea that the kids can use these little holes that are in the side as hand holes, um, as if they were rock climbing, but it's only, you know, it's only this high. So it's this, this is because it's for the younger kids, it's designed to not let them get too, too high up in the air. The, the material that we see here, all of this, the blue and the cranberry and the, um, the pink, that is all resilient surfacing. It's all designed to be specific to the height of the equipment that is, that is next to it, so for the, for the fall zones. And um, uh, that's it. Uh, I just want to uh, point out, too, that the access to the play these playgrounds for the pre-K is directly from their classroom. So there's doors from each of the three <coughs> classrooms that goes directly to the outside, to the uh, that little outdoor classroom area that Chuck just pointed to. It's uh, a surface that can have seating on it, um, but it's a good transition area from the classroom to the playground. For the kindergarten students, they'll come out the end door of the wing and go around and come into the playground from the backside. Oh, yeah. So that <clears throat> the whole area, pre-K and kindergarten, is all one fenced area. So the kindergarten just kids... The, just the pre-K. Just the pre-K. Right, okay. And the access area isn't fenced, so people can come out the doors and then walk out to the cars maybe or something. Yeah, you could. But they can go right in and then it's a fenced Yeah, area. and there'll be a gate within and the there's fence. And no, there's no constraint to the, uh, the kindergarten area. Correct. That's, Correct. yep, okay. That's just supervised, Ruby. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All, all of the play areas. And I just wanted to add that the... The double bay swing that you see off to the right it has the four swings. That is um, what we've asked for is to to have two of those swings be the the, the safe seat. Yes. Because those will be preschool. Um, that'll be that's a preschool <coughs> piece of equipment. So these here, would, two of these would be would have safety, also safety. Yeah. The little safe seat where you buckle the child in. And, Chuck, is the gate um, automatic or is it manual? Do you have it on a timer of sorts or is it? I really done that yet. I mean, we can do whatever, it, whatever people ask. For the gate? Okay. Yeah. No, the gate for getting oh, in. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the one you were talking about? No, I was actually talking about the, the fire the lane. Fire oh, lane gate. Is I, that going to be automatic or manual? No, we wanted those manual. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah we Who's going to be responsible for closing it and opening my it? My staff. Custodians. Okay. Put the flag up in the morning, open the gate. <laughs> okay, we're good on that. So that's a view of uh, the PK. You can see the fence around it. And some of the equipment. I know this looks like there's not a lot in here, but all the fall zones, um, that, that's what human being had the fall zones included into the, into the play equipment. Chuck, can I stop you? Paula, would you like to ask a question? I just wanted to ask and inquire about um, what equipment you have there that's handicapped accessible and also surfaces for all the All the surfacing is handicapped accessible. It's designed for wheelchairs as anybody else. So it's, it's, a, it's a rubberized surface poured in place and any type of uh, uh, wheelchair, anything, truck is anything like that. And equipment? Uh, the equipment is all designed for um, accessibility. Things like this are all accessible off of a wheelchair. Um, so everything's designed to be able to get to and from a wheelchair. Is there we don't have we don't have a piece of equipment like, for instance, a, a, a swing that will pick up a wheelchair. We don't have that. But that wasn't something that we were. We can look at that, but it's not something we were. 
ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, is the safety seat, can, is that one of those handicap seats where it's, you know, got the harness and it clicks in and things like that? Or is it like one of those old fashioned, you know, kind of like baby seat with the legs dangle through? Well, we can do it, we can do whatever. We have, we can, we can pick whichever we want. We should look into a handicap accessible swing, especially in that um, in that older playground area, or actually one in each area. Yeah. One in each mm -hmm. area. I think the bucket swing that, that we had requested before <coughs> is would only be <coughs> suitable for preschool age children. Mm -hmm. And it, again, in terms of what that looks like, I, I haven't really seen the more updated ones, but I think that you can get us a picture of what that mm -hmm. would look like. So you're suggesting that in, in that, because I believe that the handicap swing will take up that day. Mm -hmm. So you want one, you want, let me show you how it stands. You want one here, and then you're going to want, there's another image coming up of the, of the, um, um, the kindergarten area? Yeah, this one here. So you want one of those to be that also. I think we need right. to look at all of those and make sure that we have an option in each playground. Okay, Chuck, onward and upward. Okay, next one. And these are two images from different sides of the kindergarten um, area. Um, I think that this piece will be the one that um, kids went to first. I know that on other playgrounds that we designed, that is the, the piece that um, kids just love to be able to climb on. And um, this equipment here has all kinds of things, including um, you know, ropes for climbing here and spiral um, pole to come down and slide here. Um, again, this is designed for a wheelchair to be able to pull up on, and the student can uh, get off of the wheelchair. And then um, it's not something that it, the person's going to need to have help once he's up there to be able to get up those ladders, but the piece of equipment itself. Um, is considered to be accessible because it has it has this landing which is designed to be able to transfer <coughs> from a wheelchair onto it. And for grades <coughs> one through five, um, these here are called these blocks. They're located right here. And these are all handholds. And that's, that's pretty much what it looks like. They're all designed to be able to uh, uh, mimic or feel like you're, you're um, using a rock climbing wall. But most of the movement on this is sideways as opposed to up. One of the you can really get up at any height here is in that location. Um, we have some of this for chin-ups and some of this for um, Ten for um, um, a rope bridge. This wheel is um, is great. We are actually showing um, Ruby and uh, administrators how this works. There's some videos online of how this movement starts to happen, and it can be one person doing it or six or seven people doing it. Um, and and this is another piece of equipment similar to. The dome that you saw at the other playground, we'd like to be able to get another bigger dome here, but they're, they're an expensive piece of equipment. So this is the size that we were able to, to um, use. This is actually a, uh, for, for the older kids, the, the equipment, the other dome and the other playground, even though it looks bigger, it, it isn't. It's sort of a deceiving kind of thing. And this is designed for standing on two or three kids or one kid. And you, by, by leaning back and forth, you get the thing to start to rotate. And um, this climbing structure is there. So what we're trying to do is to get a lot of different things for climbing and for balancing and for um, um, spinning movement and that kind. So we're trying to, to make sure that we're not just putting you know, this climbing structure. We're trying to get it well done so that there's a lot going on for, for, for um, for everybody 
in all the things that they really want to try to do. And this has some perspective here. So this is the Orient Museum. This is that um, the asphalt drive that's coming around. It comes right through here. So and it also is back right about there. So these two pieces, this playground here is divided in half by that road. But again, when, it, when it's closed off, it's intended to be one big playground. And the same thing here, even though this is the actual road, because it's going to be painted and it's closed off, it becomes one big playground. Are there swings in this area? There are not. We also asked for, um, on some of that, the asphalt, the um, section there, games like four square. And actually, we asked for two basketball hoops to look at the possibility of having two, just because of, you know, we're looking at a possible 130 students out at once. So just to have some of those options. And as you had mentioned I earlier. That actually, Ruby, I was wondering why yeah. one. Yeah, we had a, yeah, so, so two anyway. and. Yeah. Okay, we'll, yeah. We'll look at adding another one. It gets a little difficult because we can't go in the other direction because then you're around the building. Um, but we'll look at adding another one also. Do you think swings are, do the first and to fifth graders don't like to go on the swings? You know, um, they do, but again, right now, in terms of the options we have, they're limited. Okay. So we do have a swing area for K through two, and we have a swing area for um, three through five. And again, they use them, um, and they're they're used pretty much co constantly. But again, with the third through fifth graders, their options are somewhat limited. Okay. I do feel like there's a lot of other options for the first through fifth graders. Um, I'm not sure that a swing um, is an is an essential piece for this area with all the other options. It takes up a lot of space. <clears throat> and, if, if we, and I'd really like us to have a handicap swing in that area for sure. And those tire swings are there. So. Yeah, yeah in this area. Right? What, do you think, what do you think, Paul, about a swing in that? We're in this area, correct? I think no, we're in the other area. area. No. <clears throat> the only really, really concern I would have would be um, how much space it would take up if it would yeah. you know, limit other things. But I mean, I, I, I think they're well used. And, so in terms of another swing area, why don't we look at, at that as an option with two swings for the first through fifth and see what that would look like? As Chuck mentioned, you know, we're working on a, a budget with this, so We'll have to look at what gets taken out in order to add something like that. Right. There might be something. I'm just saying, I was going to say, looking at the equipment here, does people have a sense of what would they'd want to come out? Personally, I think adding two swings and having to take a climbing structure or something like that that, can, yeah. that a lot of kids can use at once is not probably a, a good trade-off. Um, swings are great, but I don't know, maybe... Just looking at the numbers and how many kids are going to be out there at once, I don't know what two swings really does. Well, what about that triple somersault I area? I was thinking that. I'm, I was looking at that. So. As a <coughs> yeah, the swings that will cost more, but yeah. we'll look at it. <coughs> okay. It, also, that piece of equipment doesn't take up much room. No, no. Yeah. Right, so the room swings going to take a lot of space. It takes up more room than a lot of this other equipment because you get you, you right. have it's to be it's in, in this off. direction and in back in front of it. It, it takes up an awful lot of room. Which Even though it looks like it does, you can't put anything near it. No, and I mean I agree with Sarah. If you're going to take out something to put two swings, it's not worth it because then it's going to be a brawl for two swings. <laughs> like so, you know. Is there an opportunity maybe to put one or two swings? in the wooded area, sort of as a natural, you know how maybe off of a tree, well, we don't have trees back there now, so yeah, that, that would maybe be in 10 years, right? Um, <laughs> tree swings. <laughs> hmm. 
Um, we can look at that. The only where I, I can see it would even be happening would be in the center of that grass area that we were showing. <coughs> that was the free play area. But then it's going to then it's going to need kind of a pavement, it's going to need wood mulch around. Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll take okay. a whole space. Yeah, we'll space. Space. And our goal was to have that space be the place mm -hmm. they could run. Open. I guess mm. to that question, though, I mean, when when you asked, is there anything <coughs> on this that anybody would yeah. remove because of that? Nobody's really coming up with anything besides something less spacious. So it's obviously, these ones that are here are probably more clear priority than one or two swings. And maybe we figure out how to deal with that later on. I mean, I know something that's not going to fit without taking out that. <coughs> is, right. there, is there anything else here that anybody would remove to replace that with swings? Is there anything from that list or from that stock that? I know my kids are always going to choose the climbing. Climbing. Yeah, yeah. That's all they want to do. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they'd right. love the swings if they were there, but they, as you said, Ruby, there's so many other things there. I don't think they're going to miss them. And there's never enough swings. Yeah. I mean, never. Right. I mean, no matter what. If there's always a wait, there's always, I'll push you and right. switch. That's okay. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, I really think a lot of what they've pointed out already offers a, offers a lot for our students. So there, it's developmentally appropriate. It meets a wide range of ages. It fits um, the budget. It, it fits the budget. It's going to provide our children with some challenging equipment that's going to, you know, challenge the different muscle groups. So. Um, I understand the, the swing piece, but again, um, <clears throat> I think what we have here are some really nice options for the children, and I think um, I, overall I'm, pr I'm quite satisfied with them. I understand, you know, and I hear what Paul is saying regarding the swings. Yes, they use them constantly now, but it's because of what we have. There's no other they option. They have nothing else. Right now. <laughs> There's no other option. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was asked to just to say something about um, on our, in our spec and on the drawings, we'll be calling for an or equal on all of this, and we're, get, we're giving the name of the company and companies of the equipment that we've suggested here. But we also have to give other other manufacturer names, and even though they're not ones that we selected here, we have to throw those names out. <coughs> that that's requirement that we're, that we're tied to. So we'll be doing that. Um, and But we have very stringent specs in there written so that if it doesn't meet those specs, uh, we don't have to accept it. And I, Paul and I gathered some other information for you just in terms of the um, preschool playground guidance from both oh, QRIS and NIAC. So we just wanted to make sure you Oh, this is mine? Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's no further questions. Dan. Just one quick one. At a previous meeting, we talked about replacing the memorial tree. Is that all set? Do you have the location and information you need to do that? Uh, yeah, we're going to move the, 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 um, the monument itself to stone. Okay. Um, and the, the tree is going to go here. We haven't selected which tree it is yet, but that's where we're showing it going. Okay. It probably, unless people think strongly about it being an evergreen tree, it may not be an evergreen tree. We need to put a plant to that kind of thing instead. Unless right. it's important that it be an evergreen tree. I think Liz had a discussion with the family about what kind of tree, so I'm not sure what she... She did. As I recall, they didn't mind what kind of a tree it was. Okay. They realized that that had to go, Right. but the monument and everything and the... And they, were, they were excited that the monument was coming over and that that yeah. was going to be honored. Uh, yeah, so they seemed was, to be really pleased that was with that whole concept. Mm. Okay. So so maybe, maybe as we get a little further along and get the species uh, proposed, we somebody Definitely could... Definitely could contact could them contact and them. reach out to them again and, and find out... Uh, you know, maybe even give them a couple options in terms of what the tree is. I don't know if it's a possibility. Okay. And I'd be more than willing to reach out to them again and, and give them some options. Can you give us your name and what? Sure. I'm Carol Spiegel Um I have two daughters in the system. Okay. Um, my concern is that we're going to have to make some changes to the existing structure. And 
there's, to me, there's no ramps on any of the climbing structures, which I know is a lot of money, I understand that. But there's no ramps for her or anyone else in a wheelchair or a walker to be get, get up and around and play with other kids, other peers. Um, and there's nothing for them to wheel up to like a um, standalone structure for them to roll up to and play with. You know, we're missing, I think, if I'm, if I'm seeing this correctly, there's no place for these kids to play side by side with these peers without having to have someone get them out of their wheelchair. Hopefully they can get out of their wheelchair. What if they can't? What if there's someone who has to be in a walker all the time? Do they want to go up and play with some one of the things that are on the climbing structure, but there's no ramp for them to get up there to play on. You know, I, I think we're missing something here for kids to play together and for handicapped kids to be included. I really do. I mean, I worked really hard putting extra things at the playground as it is now so that kids could do that. I mean, I knew that this was coming, so we put some money into it, but not a ton. There's, there's nothing. There's no standalone things. That I, I, and that's why I was concerned about the handicap swing. You know, not all kids can sit up. Some of them have, you know, uh, trunk issues. You know, they have low tone. They can't sit up. I, I think that the handicapped kids have been blown over a little bit here. And that's my concern. I'm glad to hear that there is poor, you know, rubber, because I think that's very important, because it does allow them to get around. You know, someone like my daughter, who can wheel herself, she could do it on the, on the rubber. She certainly can't do it on the wood fiber. No one can push her on wood fiber, you know. Um, is that going to be addressed, or is this set in stone? Is there some, has anyone consulted with anyone with handicapped kids? I mean, Nothing is in stone at this point. Okay. So uh, uh, maybe this is a, an assignment for Chuck for the next meeting, or is there a way <coughs> um, where? I, I think uh, what would yeah. help for, for us as the designers is maybe there could be uh, some staff uh, from special education uh, classes that we could sit down with and, and come up with some suggestions and and look at what the options are together there sure we can arrange that but i had a question um on on a, are any of those structures especially the the bigger structure with the slide and the um sort of the, the ramp we had seen that earlier are any of those structures do they have built-in features for um students that are in a wheelchair um, I can't tell you that specifically. I know that all the equipment is designed so that if someone is in a wheelchair, <coughs> they're, able, there's a, they're able to transfer onto the piece of equipment. Okay. But that's correct. Yeah. So if they can't transfer, then that's a, that's a different ball game and a, diff, a, a whole different piece of equipment. So we can certainly look into that as, a, as something that you might want to introduce in, in one of these areas. But it's a different type of piece of equipment. There are certainly areas on all the, on lots of this equipment where someone can go up to it and engage with it with somebody else. Someone could be playing on this piece of equipment, and someone could be sitting here. So all through here, that kind of thing can happen. But there's nothing in here that allows someone to go up, up into it. How about the tower structures? Do they have ways? I mean, I've seen a lot of those where. On, on the tower, the ladder, there's things that you can interact with as part of the structure. Um, Just not the ones we're looking at. They exist. Yeah, like the uh, double on, tower with climbing net. Yeah, there's things on, on both sides of those where someone can engage it. Again, they just can't get up into it. With the, if, you can't, if they can't get out themselves and and go up stairs as a, you know, as using hands or whatever, mm -hmm. there's no way to be able to wheel up into it. We can look into that, it's just it's a different type of piece of equipment. We can certainly look into it. Is, it, is it possible, Chuck or Matthew, when you meet, that this mom can be at that meeting? 
Yes, we should. Yeah, no we absolutely should have Carol that. and Mrs. Tykert and a couple other special education teachers meet at the elementary and go over options. Um, and some of the, some of the options that are both um, not maybe interchangeable is not the word, but just accessible for everybody, whether a child can get out of a wheelchair or not. Because we want what we're looking for is equipment that's that offers that versatility. Does this sound like it will work for you? I definitely work with you guys. I would love to. I would absolutely love to. So I just want to make sure that our kids are included with the other kids because they want to play with the other kids. We want to be inclusive. Absolutely. Mm. Chuck? So I, I think that Matt has suggested that um, <clears throat> to determine how many pieces of equipment you might want to consider that. We can provide some ideas and say, here's what we can these are things that we can do. Um, and we can talk about them, or you can suggest maybe we want to make two pieces of equipment. Um, you know, you might want to change something that's that and make that fully wheelchair accessible piece of equipment, that's certainly a possibility. But, but aren't we saying that this type of equipment is specific, specifically designed for that purpose, you know, for these kids to play together or for someone to be able to use a piece of equipment that's handicapped um, in a way they'll, they'll enjoy it? I mean, we're talking different type of equipment, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a different so it's, so it's not something, it's it's something that exists. It, it exists now. It's the same things. It's just okay. different. You can't get up to those kinds of heights. Yep. You know, with, with the ramp, the ramp would be hugely long, mm -hmm. so you can't, you can't get up to those kinds of heights. But you could also still, you still could also have stairs on one side and a ramp on the other side that brought you up to a certain height, but again, you, you can't make, I don't think you can make every single equipment that size and that height, you can't make that entire thing accessible. Sure. But I will certainly provide all the information that I can, that I can give to you and we can talk about it and we think that's something exciting that, that um, it would be helpful for us to have um, some pictures of options mm -hmm. and also I would really want us to look at structure in each playground mm -hmm. okay. preschool kindergarten and then the one through five well, and work we, from there we're talking about having one of those swing sets be that that could be the piece of equipment that's in that's in the kindergarten area and right I'm just not sure that that's enough So I would just want us to look at it. We'll meet with Carol and, and Karen, and then determine what our options are. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Matt? <clears throat> well, if there's uh, no further discussion on playgrounds, we're gonna move to the next topic, which is also about the site. And it's um, having to do with what, what's going to happen for the two years or so while the project is in construction and the schools have to operate. Um, we need to be able to convey to the bidding contractors some level of information that tells them what the requirements are uh, for the continued operation of the school for safety and for the uh, uh, different functions that have to happen, the, the drop-off and the parking. Um, and we need to make sure that it's gonna work uh, for the school. So we've had some preliminary discussion with Ruby and um, finding out what their needs are. Uh, we've kind of brought it to one level. It's not done. We need s some initial input. We're going to go back and refine this after we kind of hear what the concerns are. But we've taken a stab uh, at, at a plan that um, lays out what the uh, operations are going to be in, in broken down into three phases. And I'm going to ask if Devin, if you want to come over here and uh, describe that a little bit because he's been working on this. Thanks, Matt. So uh, as we're going through uh, the construction document uh, phase, 
we're looking at um, how we get people onto and off of the site. So as you remember, the, uh, the northern portion of the site uh, is the current entrance and the southern portion, uh, southern access point is the exit. Um, so when construction starts, uh, there are a couple of key things that need to happen. Devin, you couldn't point that up or up there for the TV, could you? I'm thinking about people when they watch this at home. Okay. So this is the, uh, the northern portion of the site. And so this is the current entrance and the southern portion is the current exit from the site. And, and just remember, in the final design, those will be reversed. Traffic will come in in the opposite direction. Okay. So uh, the first portion of construction, I, I've got the, a couple of bullets here that we need to do. Um, first would be uh, connecting the new well, which is being uh, installed now, to the existing school. Uh, the existing wells, which are located where the existing school is, those will be cut off and, and capped. And then they'll start construction on the new school building. So the big challenge is how do we get the contractors onto the site uh, while still allowing parent drop-off and bus circulation? So we've gone through a number of iterations, and we're just showing you the latest one that we are at right now. Um, so we're proposing that the uh, northern portion of the site, uh, the current entrance, is where the contractors will come on to, uh, to access the site. Can I ask a question, Deb? <clears throat> will the workers and such for the contractor be coming in at the same time the parents will be dropping kids off? Ideally in not. In the morning? No. Seven, yeah, seven thirty, and then um, not again until after eight thirty. Yeah. So the the trickier there's ten different ways to skin this cat. Um, whether we want to keep the sort of counterclockwise rotation that is existing now to not confuse people, do we want to divide the two entrances? So you have a construction entrance and then a, a parent and bus entrance. So that's sort of what we want to talk through and. Um, I mean, you folks drive it every day, so you know the traffic patterns. And One other thing to keep in mind in all of this is that by this time, the uh, Route 58 road work will have been completed. The idea, at, as in the discussions with uh, DOT, is that the curb cuts into the site will have been completed and fixed, and we don't want to disturb those. Dan. Did we talk at a previous meeting about another entrance or using the road that was adjacent to get at the construction site? Chance Court? Yeah. yeah. That Fell through, that, it didn't happen? No, that won't, that can't happen. All right. The only way you'd be is to try to make a third curb cut, which you don't want to do. No. We, uh, I'm pretty sure at the Route 58, there's probably going to be a moratorium on, so we won't be able to cut into that for utilities or curb cuts or anything. Once they do that work, uh, we're, we're locked in. So we are actually, um, you'll see, I think we're scheduled to be there this summer or this fall. Uh, yeah. scheduled to be there. Um, but the Route 58 North entrance, north, right, shifts to the south, yes. almost a full roadway width yeah. on there. So you'll see that for the general contractors, even on board, most likely. Is there enough width there for all of those uses on that northern side? I know, that, I know that it's not going to be all used for those three uses simultaneously in an ideal situation, but there's, I mean, that's going to happen occasionally, and is, do we have the space to make that happen? So uh, first, hopefully uh, they're not all happening at the same time. Uh, 
-hmm. And secondly, as we move forward and we study this some more, there is the opportunity to widen the road temporarily. Uh, we've looked at options as uh, to maybe even having the contractor cut across this grassy area. So we do have options to uh, try to make it a little wider to try to separate them yeah. out some more. And so I was going to say the curb cut off of the highway will definitely be wide enough and then we can do whatever we yeah, need to I mean, on our property. On, we're on the yeah, site, we can do whatever we, we want, want then. Yep. Since we're tearing in, the whole place up anyway. You can put in, you know, a judge barrier or something that tries Divide. to separate yeah. the contractors from the other track. Yeah. Um, when I first looked at this, um, the red line for the parent circulation, um, I was concerned about flip-flopping it from what we're all used to doing and causing confusion. But if that's what the final is going to be, maybe it's a good opportunity to kind of get people in that mode sooner rather than later. And, so I like and the one thing we've talked about is that some of this may not actually be in place for September 1st because construction would not have begun yet, but our intention is to have it start the first day of school. Mm -hmm. So whatever the traffic pattern is going to yeah. be, we want to promote it this sure spring. So we want to tell everybody once in this by June, and then we want to tell everybody again in August, and then we want to tell everybody again the day before school starts, <laughs> and follow whatever pattern we created. Though it might be odd for the first six weeks because for the first six weeks, nothing may be going on over here. Um, what about morning drop off, which currently takes place in right. an area that the red line doesn't touch? Right. So at the Right where it's the, the John Carver building, what, what, what I'm considering um, right at the top there, near the letter R, there's that, that big tree where we would drop off right there. And student, there's a in sidewalk. In the front of the building. Right in the front of the building. Yeah. Um, there definitely will be congestion and a lot of backup. We're going to need, we're going to encourage parents to put their children on the bus, buses as best we can because that area <coughs> there. Um, you know, this will allow us to drop off, um, empty out maybe two cars at a time because the, the other side of the building, the work construction area, we are eliminating all um, students and, and staff from that side of the building. All of the children and everyone else is, needs to be on the other side. So that is going to be a heavily trafficked and um, busy area that 20 minutes from 8 to 8.20. So that's our current um, proposal to drop them off there. I think um, if it's possible to maximize the amount of parent cars that will stay on site and not be backing up onto the road, if you could have uh, two lanes, two uh, widths of uh, parents dropping off with the right kind of supervision, this can work because this is happening on my other project we're doing right now. So if you have cars uh, in the double lane condition dropping off, you'd have to have somebody there to make sure that nobody's pulling away so that the kids can get out and cross in the lane and then you release a batch of cars <coughs> and then the next ones pull up and they drop off their kids. So that's the kind of operation that's happening with my Milford project. It just takes the right kind of can you fit uh, a double lane right there? So are we, well, are we going to eliminate yeah. the parking that's there? So there are. It's wide enough right now. For parking that, and two uh, lanes? Really? That front lawn area loop is going to get discombobulated anyway. So why can't we find a way to use that area for somehow? I mean, we're, we're not going to worry about that lawn area while we're in construction, are we? I mean, we can park onto that and somehow make some kind of a pattern using that to help right. help with the congestion? Make it is wider? It? This area to the gym, not to. Yeah, but even what's there now is 24 Enough. feet wide. Yes. So yep. get two lanes of traffic in it. I was just thinking of the parking, too. Um, that would mean that during that period, nobody can come and park in that lot. Right. No, everyone, everyone that will have parked there would have been there by that time. Exactly. So does that potential double car lane impact buses that are also arriving at the same time? You'd have to stop it. You wouldn't go all the way back to the street. Right, but they could be in the front part. Mm -hmm. right. If you still want to have other cars be able to get in and out, especially emergency vehicles. 
Mm. And the buses would come in on the southern entrance and then go into the typical bus circle, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the double lane, the way that I'm understanding this, Matt, the double lane won't start till um, right above the R, right, right, right there. Right. So it would start off there. And this would allow buses to go in to the circle, drop off, and exit. And she's cones or they have cones or something? Mm -hmm. I don't know in the middle, but some cones set up to guide them in. And I, I actually, I think it's a nice, it looks like a decent plan to at least make that adjustment. But I, I'm strongly for those jersey barriers between where the construction and deliveries will go to keep it just totally mm -hmm. separate from where the parents are going to be all together. Once they get dropped off at the letter R, <laughs> Where, where are they walked to? Well, there's a sidewalk. They walk into the gym. Building. They walk all the way to the back. They get to the circle. There's, there's a little sidewalk. It's probably, I don't know, about 100 yards. Okay, there, <clears throat> there, there. Yeah. yeah. There's a sidewalk here. It would be perfectly safe, and there would be su supervision. And are they, are they then directed to their appropriate building, or what happens from yep. there? They would go into either the GJC. So right now, the way it works is K1 and 2 go into the right. EKW building in 345. It wouldn't need to be any different. Okay. And then there's supervision. And that's what the buses do right now. That's the buses drop off, and the kids get off the bus, and they go to the right building. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So no, they, they would just walk there. down and go. My only concern would be, Ruby, based on, based on the con if we were going to go with the two-lane concept, which I don't know if I'm sold on yet, <coughs> but if we were going to go on the two-lane concept, the drop-off would have to be farther down because we couldn't even start the two lanes to the R. So you couldn't drop off at the R. You couldn't do the drop-off there. The drop-off would have to be like in front of the building. You'd need to drop them off a little bit beyond the, right. the steps right now where the, that, that front end entrance used well, to gonna be. Have, they're going to have to merge the one to get out, too. Uh, right. So it's going to have to be somewhere in the middle so they have that ability to do that. Right. Sure I would it's assume... Better if it's somewhere in the middle. But I would assume they have... Th three people out there for supervision, like one, one person dividing the cars into the two lanes and then two people out managing the cars? We, we would, realistically, we probably need about five. Right now, I have three outdoors, and then I have two in the cafeteria supervising the children from 8 to 8.15. Generally, there are so, two other adults out there, too, um, supervising traffic, so... Right. So <clears throat> in terms of safety and just keeping things moving very slowly and cautiously, I'd have more out there. You need probably about four with the traffic and then two with the students because now I'm not dropping them off at the corner. I'm dropping them off at the center of the building and that just you know you just need supervision because if a child changes their mind and re or says I forgot something and turns back right you know why do you have to change the I, I understand that you're gonna have construction vehicles coming in the green line so it, either way it doesn't matter whether you enter or exit so why do you even have to change how they come in so let's say you have construction vehicles buses, coming in you're still line. gonna have to exit that same way so I guess I'm just wondering what the difference really is. Buses need to get to the loop. And if you had everybody coming in on the other side. Uh, They'd be driving out. Yeah. But can't the buses come in that way? Well, I guess that would end up being. Yeah, <laughs> right. No matter how <laughs> right. Yeah. How many it's, parent it, drop offs? It's not going to be a great setup no matter what we do. <laughs> yeah. What's your question, Dan? How many parent drop-offs do you usually get? I mean, how many you get numbers do you get? from 75 to 100 every day. Is there anything that could be temporarily worked out across the street where they could have a crossing guard and you could, the parents could go in across and have a crossing guard bring students across the street? We did throw that out there as part of the discussion, I, but... Does that I know we haven't had contact with across the street recently. The, my understanding of the last contact we have with the businesses over there now is they're not thrilled about the... Parking situation. Parking. Right, and also that they're all, that's the time their business is in operation. I don't know if they're going to want all these cars coming in when they have people coming to what time come to their usually? business. 8 to 8.15. <clears throat> what time the business is usually open? 9 o'clock? Some of them are at 8. Yeah, they have because the I believe the, the school over there, the EMS school, mm -hmm. uh, I think their classes start at 8. So, I mean, I'm not saying we couldn't reach out to them, but I just know that last time... That wouldn't Last be time the a outreach. very big loop either. Right. You wouldn't have 
You know, you do 15 cars in there and that would be full. It's a much smaller loop than in the front of the school. Right, so you're thinking yeah. they're dropping off, so they're hopefully yeah. pulling in, dropping off. But then, and then we have, step, and then we have to get everybody across, across, then we have to get everybody across 58. A group and brings them across. And then I, you. I honestly, I, I think, you know, these guys have put a lot of thought into this and they kind of do this for a living. And, and I think that yeah. their suggestions lead to a good idea for a plan to try out. Because mm -hmm. I honestly think it, it may come down to trial and error. Right. Yeah. You have to There's sort of no set it up and yeah. see what right. works. And if this doesn't work, then adjust it a little bit. Right. It's going to be a transitional process that people are going to have to deal I mean, with. We might also benefit from, and I don't, you know, I haven't spoken to the chief yeah. about this at all, but we might we might benefit from a. We it's might a, have to have to have traffic in detail there for, yeah. for this, for drop off and dismissal, or at least for drop off, out on 58. But it sounds like you get the right amount of staff, and it just needs to be readjusted to, to get it so it works for that. You know, if they're, if they're willing to expand the inside, the curves are set. Once, if there's expansions inside, there'll be plenty of room for everybody to sort of get around where it needs to be that way. I think it'll be more open than, than in our minds it might appear kind of thing. Presently, though, there's no police officer doing traffic detail in the morning or afternoon at that point. We have the SRO that's there yeah, on I a know, regular basis. I know, but I'm not one of the- He's not directing traffic. Own. Well, I mean, well, when I go by the Middleborough, school system that that route 28 there's always a detail no it's not a detail it's an officer yeah, on sorry, duty with a assume. cruiser yeah and they are there at a certain time in the morning and a certain time in the afternoon and for that 20 minutes they direct this may be something we would have to ask the chief to do for us if we get you know you're going to be trial and error you're going to have to maybe have additional help maybe i i'm going to tell you right away we're going to need to have additional it's, help we we will it's just right now um in a pretty smooth system we have to have everyone on deck to support things and make sure that um traffic is flowing smoothly and that children are onboarding safely and that they're fully supervised and that's every day from 8 to 8 20 and so we have about there, there are six people on the circle and then the eight people on the drop-off, and that doesn't include the SRO who's out there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you right away, I know that this, this it, it appears to be a good plan. I agree with James, what you're saying. We're going to need to work it out. In my experience with our families, it's really important to let them know ahead of time as much as possible, um, And but you'll end up sometimes with a parent that never had any reason to even look at the at the drop-off procedure and they all of a sudden just had to make a change because something came up in their family and they had to drop off their child and they didn't know how it worked yeah. and they needed someone there to guide them because um, they could even come in the wrong entrance so <clears throat> I am going to tell you right away we will need a, you know support on a consistent basis and a, and a traffic guard on the road can I? To, to feed off, I'm sorry, to feed off what you say, Mr. Ward, that we, when we have our district meetings there, for district meetings, they have to have an officer there mm -hmm. because it, it won't work without it. It's, it's insane to try and get out where there is no light at that entrance with the traffic on 28. And I, I think Ruby's right that even if the system goes great within the school and the staffing, if they can't get out on the road, it's not, nothing's going to move. So especially until it's figured out, it's going to be really important to have that support to make sure that it's flowing. Okay. And, and, and we'll have to obviously push the concept of no one can park because right now that right now people park up along that road and they're just not going to be able to do that can i ask a question real quick so if you're a parent um so net right now you have from 8 to 8 15 to drop your children off in the circle and then that gate is closed and then you have to go over to the parking lot and drop off that's i'm never late that's never happened to me so, <laughs> i'm just saying what would happen in that situation if you're a parent like me who that that happens you're like oh i missed it by the five minutes where do they go they're going to they're going to have to stay there they're going to have to be there and unload S still go to the same place we're not going to you know you what you know what heather i have to think this through though Ruby, can I suggest this too? Yeah. Is that you know during this transition period, we'll work with the police mm -hmm. and try to get uh, some type of a cruiser out every morning to help on the street if this turns out to be like we said. But more importantly, certainly when we start off in the season, 
you know, we'll, we'll try to get some more police uh, presence out there. And then based upon how that plays out and what your determination is, we can reduce that if need be. But we'll make sure we get enough presence out there to help you. That'll be great. Well, because like I said, we'll need it. Um, and then once, once um, people understand the system, it mm -hmm. definitely makes it a little bit easier. And Heather, just in terms of your you know, question, it may make sense that then after that 820 that parents would do what they typically do Go now. We just Go have to, to take a look. Yeah. We just have to take a look and see how, how the parking space works out because this temporary parking, um, it's a, a 40 parking space estimate. Okay. So we, we just really have to look at that and see what we have for space for teachers, like that, right? Yeah. And then um, just in terms of clarity on that yellow line, the staff circulation, um, the, the buses would go, <coughs> there isn't a, a drawing for the buses, but the bus would go in. It's on the next page. Yeah, next, next page. Okay, on the next page. All right. All right, sorry. It would go into the circle. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Did you want to add anything, Paula, to that drop-off procedure that we talked about? Um, I, I think if coming in the end, it, it is going to be a little bit tight and scrapping a lot and trying to a little bit disturbing. <laughs> but um, we would need to make sure we had probably a couple of extra staff out there to help, not, necess not, not just on the street, not on, just on Route 58, but also in the front of the building. Um, we have three people out handling cars right now, and they're, they're not crossing in front of other cars. We're very careful about that. We have two people up in the driveway, and we, we have lots of backup on Route 58 in the morning as it is. So when we have to close the gate contractually at 15, so we have no choice, and cars have to go park. Um, if teachers are parking in the temporary space, <coughs> We also talked, um, Scott and I and, and Paula talked a couple weeks ago with, with um, the designers about the possibility even of having drop off at, for example, the middle high school or, or central office and then having a bus yeah. get the children over. So uh, we've also talked about an earlier start, all right, but you know, 10 or 15 minutes for just for drop off. I, we, we really don't want to have to go there because then I have to have staff. Um, but we've, we've talked about several options. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I was just talking about that same thing. I said, what about the town hall area? If there was some designated spot where you could have a drop off and a shuttle bus that runs back and forth if you get to the point where you have to alleviate the traffic. What about doing that for staff? Having staff park well, We've talked park. about that as well. I mean, the staff have to park at the middle high school yeah, and then take a bus. a bus over. They have a running club, right? They can just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I think we're gonna have to do. And, but that point. that's more of a that's more of a parking concern than an arrival yeah. dismissal concern. I mean, ultimately, the, the teachers are all there. They're not part of the traffic for arrival. Well, they, sh they shouldn't be. <laughs> Depending on the number of spots we have, where we're talking about doing parent drop-off, those existing spots are going to stay. Those are obviously going to have to shift 90 degrees. They're on a 45 coming in now. We're going to have to shift those to the other way, 45, which is no big deal. It's just line painting. Mm -hmm. But we could designate some of those for late drop-offs. If we have enough in our over in our temporary parking, if we have enough of staff, we can maybe make half of those spots I'm trying to think well, like there's probably 30 out there yeah, we could do like 10 minute parking yeah. or we can dedicate <clears throat> some of those to late drop off so anybody that comes in after 815 they park right there and then they have to walk the child in as they do now so I have my own spot this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, temporary parking dock and gray is that in addition to what the parking lot is there now yes, yes. yes. okay all right I see so the reason I put there was the area that we are designating as a contractor's area. 
there was some parking zone that was kind of half parking, half play area. Speaking of safety. Is that uh, really actively parked on it, or is that really the parent drop off today? That's really the parent drop off. There, there are about ten spaces, parking spaces that teachers do use, but they um, have to be there before 8 o'clock. <clears throat> and then that space is used again at 2.30 because uh, parent pickup. So parents park there, and for parent pickup, they have to go inside the building. We haven't talked about parent pickup yeah. yet. <laughs> I was just going to ask that. <laughs> so, so they park there, uh, and again, we have anywhere from 75 to 100. 25 students picked up on a daily basis, so they park there beginning at 2.30. But between the hours of, of 8 and 2.30, it's a um, play space. We do still have traffic going, um, you know, food deliveries yeah. that uses that. We're going to talk about the deliveries again. Yeah. Yeah, so we are still... Uh, designating this uh, northern access point as where the deliveries will come in and leave from. So there's plenty of room for them to be able to get to the existing areas. Where's your staging area for the equipment? That would be yours. For the construction? That would be on the construction area. Enough room? Not yet. Built in tight urban yeah. tight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. You'll have to work it out. And the contractor may have to have their people park somewhere else and get the shovel. Yeah. Right. We wanted to leave some room around the side of the Governor, Governor uh, Carver building for deliveries, but also for emergency access. Yep. I'm sure the fire people will want that. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. At first, we didn't think we would have the ability to have any parking on that side. But the way we're showing it, it may be possible to retain some spaces on it. It may not be ideal to have lots of traffic mixing on that side of the site, but it's possible that you can retain some parking there, and with the addition of the temporary parking we're adding, have you know, at least what you have today, if not more. And I could see the custodians and cafeteria staff <coughs> parking back there. They <coughs> arrive earlier sometimes and leave later. Can I raise a point so. maybe to Dave? Mm -hmm. um, that shed that's sort of gumming up the works yes. between the two buildings. Yep. Um, I know when it's busy, that area gets very congested because you can really kind of only squeeze one lane of traffic through behind mm -hmm. there. Um, Mostly if it's like the Y pickup or after school activities pickup that take place right. behind the back building. Is there a way to get rid of, get it. Rid of that? Just, I mean, Not. as step one for during construction well, to alleviate some space and maybe help? Not really, no. Um, but the traffic won't be as bad now. See, it's, it's busier now because that's where the Y does pick up and drop off. Mm -hmm. So now. If, like Matt said, we can retain some of those spaces, basically it would just be for staff. So they'd be in once in the morning and, and out in the afternoon. And there won't be any students walking by there now at all. Um, I really wouldn't gain any parking by um, take, getting rid of that building. <coughs> and some of the trees that are there, um, I may be able to widen it a little bit because they're going to come down for the construction. It depends on how close that fence gets. So it may become naturally a little bit wider with tree removal mm -hmm. yeah R right now <coughs> the intent to maintain the Y and after school program throughout the entire construction period yes it is we may have to shift um we will have to shift in terms of how they have their drop off in their their pickup but i can definitely see that that parking in the back will, will be useful right now um, the way it works is you cannot park back there if you are leaving between the hours of 8 and 3. So you, you just because of the traffic and students are back and forth at all times. So um, that would stay the same. In terms of the parking, I know you're looking at expanding the parking lot out. Can it be expanded the other way towards the building? I mean, I know there's a sidewalk there now, and I guess so. yeah, no, towards 
the field. And that's a pretty big field. Yeah, we've got the septic. septic. Oh, those septic tanks there now. And the other thing we can is the that's what those are. The current front yeah. parking spaces are. That whole grass area could become yeah. parking so if need be. Right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But. So how many parking spaces? Remind me, Matt. How many parking spaces um, do we have now in the existing and then the temporary? And then the parking in dock, the back dock, that we want yeah. to try to reserve. But I think they're pretty. So in terms of parking for staff. We I mean, actually increase I'm, a little bit. I'm, I'm comfortable <laughs> with that. I'm, we're going to have, have more space. <laughs> I'm just more concerned about the, the drop, drop off and the right. pickup. Drop off and pickup. Right. Yeah. Wait till there's an event at the school when this is going on. <laughs> mm. All right. Then parking is going to be an issue. Right. Busing. Yeah. 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 Get a bus or something. It's, I mean, it's going to happen. You have to work through the kinks. We're getting mm -hmm. yep. a brand new school. We'll yeah, work through it, you know. Situation. Right. <coughs> One of the things that we might have to do for pickup, and we really haven't talked about this. We haven't talked about it. For pickup, we may have to have to change the hours, essentially, for pickup. Because I can't have the buses picking up and parents picking up. There, we don't have the room on the site yeah. with the construction going on for both to happen at the same time. So it, what I'm thinking, in other words, is something like this. If you're going to be picking up your child, that may need to happen between 3 and 310. Yeah, a little bit change it. When everyone's, when right. the buses have already left. The buses leave, right? The buses have to leave first. The, right. So right. in that case, you could use the loop. Then you could use the loop. You would use the loop. Yeah. You'd have the buses gone, and then. Because you get more queuing happening in the afternoon, correct? <clears throat> And in the morning? Well, in the afternoon, we park in the parking lot. Right. We don't line up. It's not live. Mm -hmm. We physically go in and sign the kids out in the, in the afternoon. But in the morning, it's just you drop them off and go, don't get out of the car. So yeah. that's, that's the bigger issue probably with the traffic backup, but the parking in the afternoon would be an issue. Right. So in terms of um, dismissal, I've thought a lot about it, and I can't come up with another option before 3 o'clock. You know, d our dismissal time is two, between 2.40 and 2.45. But we don't really, um, the last bus doesn't leave the site until 2.53, 2.55. And again, I just can't have both of them taking place at once. Right, yeah. So these are details we're going to have to work out. Yeah, this is going to be yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 But not tonight. I, yeah, yeah I, think, <laughs> I, I think the point of the discussion is all these things are being taken into consideration. Yeah, yeah that's just what we need to point out. Right. right. Yep. For the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Signage is so important too. I mean, areas that are well signed and yeah. show people how to what to do when they pull up and where they're going is mm -hmm. so helpful. So, in terms of phasing, once you get by that hurdle, the rest of the <laughs> 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 that was just the first problem. <laughs> This phase, uh, we're anticipating that the buildings are going to be coming down, and then we'll have the main drive available for drop-off and pickup. So the parent drop-off loop will be available, and also <coughs> the bus drop-off loop. Uh, unfortunately, we're not thinking that the parking is going to be available for the first part of that phase, so the temporary parking will still be in place, so there'll be a little bit of a walk to park and mm. Get to the school. It's through the summer, so it should be fine. That's for the first few months. Uh, probably the first few months of that. Both schools first open, right. So that's now ju the summer of 2018. Right. So the idea is that summer is critical to get the buildings, buildings down. down. <laughs> before school starts. 
We'll be happy if we achieve that goal. If the buildings are down, the loops in prior yeah. to the school starting. When, <laughs> yeah, prior, yeah, yeah, when we achieve that goal. Yeah. Part of the key to make that happen is that we have a date the buildings the summer before. Mm -hmm. So we can that, that means that the schools have to be empty for the summer, that intervening mm -hmm. summer. So if we can get them abated then, that gives us the chance to, for them to just demolish the buildings and not have to abate because that's going to add, you know, the abatement in the back building isn't extensive by any means. The front building won't be. So we plan on, plan on that summer of 2017. 2017. We'll have summer school or the Y. Yeah, there's no. Do it at the high school, can't Yeah, we'll be at the middle high school. Do it at the high school, and that'll be no staff. <coughs> right Right. A bait means like the asbestos and all that. If you're just going to tear the building down, you don't have to do that. A bait, Mr. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. And is that what we have built into our schedule? A bait during. 2017 mm -hmm. and That's demo 2018. Yeah. We, we want to give them the opportunity. Ultimately, it's going to be really up to the general contractor whether or not they want to take advantage of that. So the advantage to them is they can possibly get off the job two or three months earlier. So they're saving on their general conditions costs, their staffing costs. Yep. Um, there might be some added costs. So if they want to be four tile, they might have to put down a tent like industrial carpet, something like that. Um, but that's something that I think is more means and methods, but we need to give them the option. Another option and a fail safe. Since uh, there's only a, a little bit of overlap of the existing Carver building and the uh, the shed building, if they prioritize just that portion in order to get the road in, they can still just demolish uh, later and still have the road in and be able to access the school. So there are options out there. For them. Now the shed's going to go. <laughs> yeah, the shed goes. What, what about, uh, I think John Deli brought up in the past, during this summer where we're demolishing, getting rid of the abatement or whatever, that repurposing any of the uh, material from the old school going into the new school? Wasn't there talk about either, either pavement or something? So the um, um, bricks. Gravel. We'll have a, a Would that be happening at the same time? Target. So we have to hit, usually we get about 90% um, recycled content. The option again, so put that under the, uh, the asphalt or the base course. Um, or they might have another job with miles of the road and they might want to ship it off that project so it's off the site. You know, site. So it, at this point, all we can really do is just leave the options open to the general contractor and allow them to be as efficient as possible. And that's what's going to get us the most competitive number. So, Chad, just so that I understand you correctly regarding the abatement. So in order for us to be able to move into the school in the fall of 2018, the abatement process ideally should be done the summer before? Yep, summer 2017. It may not be 100% of it, but if we can get a lot of the contaminants out, get our clean air testing, get the students in, and if we can get 100%, then perfect. I just don't know how realistic that is. Right. So, so if the contractor decides that he wants to follow that plan, what contingencies do we have in place in the event that their process is delayed and we can't get into the building in September when school starts for the, for the 2017 year? We have to attach damages to that. So if they run the we put a daily damage clause we can also buy float in the schedule to uh, complete clean, clean air tested out of the building by, say, August 15th, so that there are right. in there. Okay. The only time for the teachers to get back in and set up classrooms are anyway. We would, um, we generally have a sense several weeks ahead of their training ahead or behind schedule too, so if we do see that they're training behind schedule, we can tell them, wrap it up, 
clean air test, you have to have this. There's people coming in this building. So. Okay. All right, and then the, uh, the last phase of this, uh, next slide, is once the, uh, the buildings are down, they just focus on the fields and the parking. Uh, And that's it. Easy. And that, yeah, that, there it is. All the parking would be completed, and you'd be able to start using that. So the fields would take some time because um, ideally they would get any seeding <coughs> in by the frost. Um, but even then, you want to not have people fight on it for one whole season. Two hours were established. I would count on not being able to raise money for PTO, PTO. Anything you get to Would that include any of the grass areas within the playgrounds? Be done. All right. <clears throat> so, what would the the completion date for the playgrounds be? That's when things could be ripped apart. I believe that should be hmm. operable by the time of school. That's the the community is feeling like they're thinking about them and okay. getting rid of them. Okay. The rubberized surfaces, that's not a problem. It's more about any grass surface. You don't want to. Have the kids playing on until it really gets established. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? Or? Uh, so to wrap up our part, I just want to come back to the uh, questions that were brought up the last time when we had. Uh, shown you images where the that we had openings from the second floor down to the first floor and there's some talk about the nature of that guard and how safe it would be this is uh, one of the uh, sections that we've shown with the second floor overlooked down into one of the gathering areas uh, and as we explained before we have uh, solid uh, guardrails it's essentially a low wall that comes up to 42 inches off the floor, which is what building code requires. And uh, so some request if we could show you how that's been handled in other projects. And so we just went back into some of our school projects to get you some images. So this is three different school projects with three different types of guardrail, but they all meet that code requirement of 42 inches off the floor. The one to the very left, that's a solid wall condition, similar to what we're proposing. Uh, in, in a school building, you can see the nature that it's used both on the stair and it wraps around to form uh, a balcony condition looking over a cafeteria. And uh, the middle picture is uh, showing an overlook condition that's actually glass with a metal uh, support system colored glass there. You can see what it looks like from below, looking up. And then the last one is uh, a, a mesh, a metal mesh uh, infill guardrail condition. Uh, again, you can, b all of these have the pictures from below and, and above. Is your first recommendation aesthetic? Or is there a reason why you recommend the first? It was mainly aesthetic in this case, yeah. It was just so we didn't have lots of little, you know, the, the guardrails are made up of lots of little pieces that they have to put together, and we wanted something that was kind of simpler and, and just uh, a single form. Uh, and then in these slides, these are all within stairs themselves, but it's a stair has a guardrail condition where you have that same uh, balcony-like uh, condition, so there's pickets in one of them, there's the mesh infill in another one, and the last one is a combination of solid and guardrail conditions. That last one's actually an older school building that's in Somerville, um, and uses a kind of guardrail that's not allowed to be used anymore, those horizontal 
uh, railings, which could act as a ladder. So that's why we don't, <laughs> we don't see those anymore. <laughs> we won't be doing that in this school. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to point out that you do have this condition today to some limited extent in the Go Governor John building uh, at the stairs. The red indicates the top uh, condition of a stair. And this is actually a worse condition than what we're providing because this has much more open area. It's, it doesn't meet today's code. And uh, it's not even to, to the height that we're talking about. <laughs> so it's a you know, safety thing that you've been dealing with over the years. And you know, we're going to provide a, a safer version of that. This is helpful. I appreciate that. OK, good. So that's uh, all we had for the design update. Okay. Um, next steps, Chad. Yep. Oh, yeah, um, so next week on May third, we have uh, estimate reconciliation. Um, so that will be taking place with HNFH, uh, their estimator, our estimator, and PNI. Um, I'm not sure Michael or anyone else will be joining us, but we're certainly invited. May 4th, we have a meeting with Hong Kong. Uh, that's the hearing, so that's the normal Conservation Commission meeting they have that um, whatever Tuesday it is for the month. Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, it's a meeting in this room? Yep. Okay. Oh, downstairs? downstairs. Or downstairs. Where, wherever Whichever. they regularly meet. Usually Conservation Commission meets here. Oh. Yeah, on the 24th yeah. for the uh, planning board yeah. agenda. We're on the 24th? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Michael's just saying that we're on the 24th for the planning board as well. 60% um, okay. construction documents are due on May 20th. Um, there'll be another uh, MSPA respon uh, response and questions, and we'll reply to those. Uh, same thing at 90 on um, July 1st. 100% uh, construction, construction documents on August 19th. Early September would be the filed, uh, filed trade sub, and then late September would be the <coughs> contractor with a notice to proceed in early October. Um, so those are the next steps. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on, on those folks? Everything is on track for, to meet all of those. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And uh, we'll have, <clears throat> for all set on those, uh, we'll have public comment period now. Any folks that would like to speak? I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I wanted to do that with folks as long as we don't have big groups because it, whatever question you have pops up, it's a good time to ask of the folks that are doing the planning and all then. So thank you. So, okay. Anybody, I guess, no one else? Okay, next thing would be uh, new business, and that would be mainly next meeting. No? But we might have somebody has some new business. So uh, what do we need now, Chad or Walter, for our next meeting? I would uh, recommend that we meet right after the estimate reconciliation meeting. So May 3rd is a Tuesday, that's on the reconciliation. As if we're going to go with uh, Mondays, it would be May 9th. If we want to go back to Wednesdays, it would be May 4th or May 11th. Our meeting's on the 9th, right? Yeah, the school committee on the 9th. <coughs> 9th is a Monday, Scott? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what was the other alternative we had? Fourth, ninth, or four eleven. Or we can even go to the sixteenth. The submission of the MSBA is going to go in on Friday, May twentieth. So as long as we meet really after the estimate reconciliation of May third, the only um, the only reason I'd recommend that we meet sooner rather than later is uh, when these new estimates come in. Uh, of course, we're going to go through the design and costs. 
exercise, we're going to look at what contingencies were absorbed, what escalation has been absorbed. Um, if we do need to uh, get a recommendation from this group, if we have uh, value management decisions that need to be made, it's better to make them sooner so that then that can incorporate them. So the 16th gets a little late. Um, is it the same thing? This time around, we don't have to have the VE incorporated into the design document. I don't believe it. thought it was all except the 100s. Okay. Um, I'm pretty, I think it's the same guidelines now. Something, okay. We can, yeah. So I have, I have a question, Matt, and Chad. So would the fourth be too early to include the playground items that we discussed tonight on that agenda? Uh, a week. week. Well, the fourth is already the conservation commission yeah. night. Oh, okay. The fourth con con. So that won't work. So the eleventh. Mm -hmm. So the eleventh. <coughs> the eleventh is Wednesday, right? The next Does week. That work? Yeah, I think okay. we could do that for the playground. Okay. So uh, we're shooting for I think May eleventh. I think we talked about this last time. I cannot. I can't do the eleventh, but that's fine. I have an obligation. Okay. I'm an obligation. I'm speaking that evening at the uh, Social League Scholar Athletes Dinner. Um, Very good. But, yeah, that's good. Um, but that's fine. You can. But you're gonna. You've been meeting ongoing with everybody. Yeah, yes. And Ruby, so yeah. you're getting I'm, input. I'm in com everything. Yeah, because just looking at the dates, that yeah. I'm fine with it. Just wanted everybody to know I can't do the. I won't okay. be able to be here on the 11th. Is uh, I mean, it sounds like the May 11th is gonna be it. No. Mm -hmm. Oops. <clears throat> Um, all right. So I guess if, I guess my only can I, I say that now, but my only concern would be if there's going to be value engineering, I want to be part of that process. I don't want the committee taking things out of the project with yeah. me not here. Right. No. 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 We would want you. Yeah. I think if <laughs> that was an issue, we'd know it ahead of time after the meeting on the third. Yeah. Because yeah. the meeting on the third will dictate what the schedule is. Right. And we can meet. You know, as a prior to that. Group outside to take care of, you know, coming up with a list. Mm -hmm. well, well, what about the 12th? Could we meet the, on the 12th, Thursday night? I cannot come on the 12th. Okay. In fact, you can't either. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I didn't look at my already, schedule. Uh, accepted an invitation to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So May 11th, going once, going twice. Bingo, May 11th, 7 o'clock. Okay. Is there any other new business or things that need to come up? Okay, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you at home. Thank you.